friends. This is Anne P. of the Fiber Floss and Fiction podcast. Today is Sunday, June the 14th, uh, 2019. And I have a new podcast here today for you that will include my knitting, uh, books, as well as stitching information. And I hope everybody is doing well. Uh, a warm welcome to both returning viewers as well as anyone who might be new. I hope that things are well in your corner of the world. We are definitely in the middle of summer here. Summer is my least favorite season. I don't like the heat and we're kind of socked in with that right now here in New Mexico. Um, we had some great storms over the 4th of July weekend. My husband was home. We had two nice big rainstorms, um, but haven't had any rain since then. So yesterday I spent watering trees and trying to keep things going. Um, hopefully we'll get some thunderstorms here in the short term. Uh, but just having a quiet weekend otherwise, last weekend we did a bunch of stuff out in the yard with some cleanup and... Um, gardening things. We took a run to up to the garden center and got some items to put uh, like a new bird bath out in that's out that side of the house which is where our, our kind of turnaround is that as you come in our deck and just hung up wind chimes that we didn't have a shepherd's crook for that kind of stuff you know nothing major nothing big landscaping although my husband has some plans for big landscaping um maybe this fall uh we'll see anyway um so i hope things are well wherever you are that the season is treating you right let's go ahead and jump in and get started um in the world of knitting quick announcement that uh i will be teaching at Stitches Midwest, which is outside of Chicago, uh, Schaumburg, Illinois. It's uh, held in a big conference center there. That will be the last day of July. I'm, I'm there July 31st, I fly in, and then classes are the first, second, third, and fourth. And I'm teaching Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. So otherwise, I will be in the Yarn Guys booth. I will have Willy Wonka Fibers yarn and patterns, uh, a few kits. And we'll also be doing a book signing uh, for the Vikings collection on Friday in the afternoon. So if you are in the area and want to swing by the marketplace, uh, that's where I'll be. I think my I think my classes were sold out, but they've opened up some extra slots. So if you had tried to uh, sign up for any of those, uh, either the two I'm teaching, the class on yokes or the yoke sweaters or the class on um, Inspired Fair Isle, developing a, fair, a color work palette for uh, stranded knitting projects. There may be some class openings um, available now, even though they appear to have been sold out earlier. So if you were waiting and thought, oh, I can't get into those, but have interest, please feel free to trundle on over to the site and take a look. I will link to the event down below. Um, I will also be teaching at Stitches Salt Lake in October, which is a new event. And I will be at Stitches SoCal again in November. Is that it, I think? I think that's it for the rest of the year. Um, plenty, that's plenty of travel, all good. Um, I have finished up my secret knitting project that I was working on. Um, it's a sweater for the Celtic collection. I'll be photographing images of that this week, so have a pattern to release around the 1st of August. Um, should have that sample in the booth as well at Stitches Midwest to kind of kick that off. Um, I'm then also still working on my beekeeper cardigan. I am knitting this from a DK weight Polworth wool and silk blend from the shop. So this is Wooly Wonka Fibers Atina. That's the name of the yarn. And it is dyed in the colorway brocade. One of my favorite bases, the Polworth is nice and soft. The silk gives it some shine and some drape. So I have the body completely finished. Let me show you the back so you can see the stitch pattern with all these cute baby bees on it. Um, it has kind of a wide ribbing at the bottom, which is going to block out to just hang pretty loosely. It's not going to draw in very much like a lot of ribbings do. 
Um, I have the neck band finished as well as the front bands and now I have picked up the stitches for the sleeves and I'm marking those down. So I'm working on sleeve one, more of that cute baby bees pattern. Um, I am knitting this pattern exactly as written, which I have to admit I don't do that very often anymore. Um, and so my point for doing that was I'm kind of trialing it to see if it might be a good one to use for uh, a club kind of knit along next year. And what I wanted to be able to do is tell you guys some places to be aware of, if you will, in the pattern, um, just some notes and things like that. So uh, in general, it's, it's a very well written pattern and I'm enjoying knitting it up. And I think it will be a nice uh, staple in my wardrobe there's a few things about it that I don't love, but um, there are some ways to get around that if you're not trying to knit it exactly like the pattern. So I'm hoping uh, having that the samples done, if we do decide to use this for a club, I'll be able to walk a lot of you through um, places that I maybe would change or would want to do slightly different, just to give you all a heads up. So. Uh, that's where that is. I don't have any specific, you know, date time that it has to be finished by, but my guess is in the next month I'll have that one finished up. Uh, so that's it for knitting. Let's move on to books. I have three books to talk about this time that I have finished. I have a few others in the works that I'm reading, which I'll just casually mention at the end, um, but we'll talk about when I'm finished them. The first is The Witches of New York by Amy McKay, um, a book my dad sent me knowing that I would love it, which I did. Really really fun book. It's historic fiction, it's magical realism, um, it's set in New York City in the spring of 1880 and the, the event that kind of kicks off the book is the... Cleopatra's Needle, which is an obelisk that was brought from Egypt to New York and set up um, as sort of a tourist attraction. Um, but there was a lot of oddities that surrounded the, tr the obelisk's trip into New York and getting it set up. So there's two, sort of three main characters in this book. The first two are the two ladies who are sort of the witches of New York. Um, one is kind of a wise woman in the sense that she does, she makes teas and herbal remedies and is generally somebody who just lives her life based on common sense. Uh, the other is a seeress. She can look into the future. And um, so that's Adelaide Tom, who's the seer, and uh, Eleanor St. Clair, who's the kind of wise woman. And they have a little tea shop and so they offer advice as well as teas and tinctures and other things like that to kind of gentry and wealthier members, women members of New York society. They wind up hiring a young shop girl named Beatrice who as it turns out can see ghosts. And so wrapped up in all of this is some of the actual history of the 1880s where um, people were interested in having seances and contacting the dead and that was sort of like a social event, if you will, like you could buy tickets to it kind of thing, um, as well as some of the backlash for things like that where uh, God-fearing, uh, that's sort of how it's described in the book, um, members of church congregations were trying to stamp out any uh, taste or hint of impropriety or things that were questionable with witchcraft. I'm sure that's Kim texting me, no one else te or messaging me, I'm sure. I'm sure of it, Kim. We'll talk to you momentarily. Um, so there's some great history in this about the late 19th century uh, in New York. There's really wonderful characters in this. Um, there's sort of an evil, misguided um, church minister who is trying to stamp out 
any kind of witchcraft, even the vaguest hint of it. Um, yeah, I really like this book on a number of different levels. Um, hit a lot of buttons for me, so I would recommend that one um, to anybody who likes any of those genres, historical fiction or things about like School of Witches, witchcraft, that kind of stuff. Okay, next I uh, finished listening to a very long audiobook, which was The Priory of the Orange Tree. And I know several of you have already read that. Um, I became aware of it from Jessie Marie, uh, her description of it. And pretty much if Jess likes it, I am going to like it too. So after I had finished up Game of Thrones, I started Prior of the Orange Tree. So it's similar in that it is a very long epic fantasy that has dragons in it. Um, it's set in kind of a vaguely Tudor-esque period and kind of the main um, country that focuses on it is similar to England. The description of dress and the fact that they're a naval power and um, just a lot of the things that they talk about in terms of social life at the court are, are kind of Elizabeth, Elizabethan Tudor era based. However, this book is definitely a, a girl power book. The main characters in it from assassins to mages to queens uh, rulers tend to be women. There are some men in power in this, but kind of the main characters in this book are women, which is really fun. Um, there is a sort of ongoing struggle between the East and the West, and the West is against dragons completely. There is no such thing as a good dragon in the West. And the reigning monarch, the legend goes that as long as one of the Baratheonet line is on the throne, the dragons will never rise again. Um, we come to find out that that's not really true. And the Western court has been at odds with the East, who they term the worm lovers. But the East has a relationship with their dragons. Um, who are cool-blooded creatures. They're not the fire breathers. They're basically like sea dragons. And to be in the company of one of those dragons is to be in the company of a god. And much of the description of the East, um, she's got a lot of references to uh, Chinese uh, le legends, Chinese uh, thought, uh, kind of... A, a sparseness to their life that echoes some teachings that have their basis in things like Buddhism. She's done a really nice job of building a Tudor era world that's not so dissimilar from the one that we know that you can't relate to it at all, but has enough differences that it makes for a really fun story to see all the twists and turns in it and how she's approached different things. Um, so there's all kinds of, adve of adventures. One of the main characters is a sea dragon rider. She's kind of an elite ninja trained warrior guild. Um, one of the main characters is, um, she's a handmaid to the queen um, Sebron, who is sort of Elizabeth Tudor in this book, and actually the queen is one of the main characters as well, but her handmaid is also one of the main characters, and she has come from a completely different land. She, it sort of parallels, I think, to the Middle East, sort of. I mean, there's some differences, but sort of. Um, there's alchemy in it. There's tons of dragons who do not just appear peripherally. They are an integral part of the story and characters in and of themselves. There's all kinds of fun little bits of magic and magical creatures. And one of the complaints that I saw pop up quite frequently in the reviews was that this book is too long. 
It's not any longer than Game of Thrones, and honestly, I think Game of Thrones could have had more edited out it out of it than this book could have had edited out of it. Um, it's a little bit slow at kind of the seven eighths mark, just before sort of this end epic battle that the book's been building up to. But it didn't it didn't bother me. I felt like it was still a worthwhile piece of the story to read and advance the plot and advance the characters and contributed to the story. Um, I just loved it. I really loved it. It was super long. It kept me occupied for most of the month of June, um, but I still loved it. I would highly recommend it if you like epic fantasy. If you liked Game of Thrones, my guess is you will probably like this book. Um, I will say with the caveat that there are some non-traditional love interests in it. So if that's not your thing, uh, then you probably will not enjoy the book. But otherwise, yeah, if epic fantasy is your is your jam, go for it. Uh, the final book that I read, uh, which is for a prompt from the School of Magical Stitches and Literature, is called Chesapeake Requiem. It's a year in the life of the Tangier Waterman. So I picked this book up um, as a book written by a journalist. That was the prompt. And it's a relatively new book. I think it was published in 2018, the end of 2018. Uh, so nonfiction. The book is about Tangier Island, and if you aren't familiar with that or know anything about it, um, where Virginia and Maryland meet on the east coast of the United States, and the Chesapeake Bay comes in there, and where the Potomac dumps into the Chesapeake Bay, there are some very small islands. Um, there used to be more. They have either been eaten up by rising sea levels or have just eroded away completely. Uh, but Tangier Island was kind of the largest of those and has been inhabited since uh, the late 18th century. It's a community that's still very isolated from the world. Um, almost everyone who lives on the island is uh, a fisherman and the, they focus on uh, Chesapeake Bay blue crab. There is some oystering, there is some other sort of peripheral things associated with the in fishing industry as a whole, but it's primarily focused on blue crabs, which are a huge thing. Um, if you've ever been to Maryland or Virginia, um, crab cakes and soft shell crabs and all of that is a big deal there. Um, the island has gone through periods of time where you know, they did not have electricity. They have been very slow to come into the 20, 20th century, not even the 21st, but the 20th century. Um, and they tend to be um, a fairly religious people and they tend to be fairly conservative. Uh, they even have their own um, accent that you know, hasn't been changed by a lot of mainstreaming. And their island, their home is disappearing. Um, basically every storm that comes through, they lose more of it. And so the book is not only about kind of a day in the life of, um, which is interesting in and of itself because how they, I mean, you're gonna, you're gonna learn a lot about crabs that you probably didn't know you needed to know, but that it, they're very interesting. Um, but also about the fact that these are folks who, you know, are, uh, many of them are not willing to accept the fact that they are losing their home. They don't want to move. They don't feel they should have to move. Um, there's a lot of discussion about, you know, how much is worth saving for this diminishing population that, do, that they're super, super specialized. I mean, they basically do one thing. And if you are someone born on the island, you have the choice to either you have to do the one thing, which is crabbing, or you have to decide that you're going to leave and go away and make your life elsewhere on the mainland. And, um, you know, a lot of them have lived very sheltered lives and they're not in a position to, I mean, no one on that island is rich. They're not in a position to send their kids off to um, Harvard and just write a check. That's not going to happen. Um, 
I thought the author did a really, really good job of kind of balancing some of the practical issues about trying to save this little piece of land in the middle of the water and saving the history and the lifestyle and everything that goes along with it and what the cost to the taxpayer might be and what the ethical dilemmas are surrounding that. Um, I really enjoyed this book. I, I'm sure it helps that I'm familiar with the area. Um, I haven't been to Tangier, but um, we used to live on the northern neck of Virginia. I've lived in Virginia. My parents currently live in Maryland. Um, my husband and um, we've sailed a sailboat uh, in that area. There's actually one of the marinas there that we've docked at. So we know the area well enough that I can picture a lot of that in my head, which is helpful. But even without that, I think this is still a really interesting book. Um, and Lisa of Lisa Stitchin and such. I know you like American history type things, you would probably enjoy this book um, quite a bit. Uh, as a footnote, it's sort of interesting because it's written contemporarily enough that it talks about the Trump election and how the Islanders um, view his policies. So that, that's kind of an interesting little tidbit to the story. Um, very well written. Uh, I devoured it. I think I read it in less than a week. It was it was one that I was like, oh, I'll read it and see how it goes. But yeah, definitely worth the read. So really enjoyed that. All right, we're going to move on to Cross Stitch. I have a lot of stuff to show you guys because I had a lot of different little prompts for homework, which is pretty much the state of all of us, I think. Uh, I'm not going to go into all the specific prompts particularly, uh, mostly because I can't remember all of those, and it's been a while since I recorded. But we're we're just gonna we're just gonna go through them. Uh, the first one I worked on is lesson one of Summer Schoolhouse. This is a four piece collection, so there's four little ones in in this. Uh, design is by Brenda Gervais. This is the one I'm working on. I'm doing them all on a 32 count cream Monaco. Um, and I'm using mostly color and cotton, but some gentle arts threads as well. And this is where I've gotten to. These are done one over one, so they're pretty small. So this is this corner right here. So I'm here, I finished that out here, and I think I have three more flowers to do to get down to the, the grass. So this was a really fun stitch. I enjoyed working on that every minute of it. I love how delicate it is. I love the colors. Yeah, i um, actually really excited to try to get back to this at some point. But it was also nice to get some progress in on it since I hadn't worked on those at all since I started them. Um, I only had like a leaf done on each one of them. Okay, next up uh, is Joan Elliott's Autumn Fairy. That's what she's gonna look like when she's finished. And I am marking this on a 28 count even weave. It was a club fabric from Chromatic Alchemy. The colorway is Feronia. I don't know what that refers to, but it's a pretty um, kind of peachy, brownish, green-ish, subtle. Um, and so I have her rather strangely disembodied hand happening there and uh, what else did I add? Oh, I added in this section here and I worked on this wing right here. Her face is, is finished um, and her headdress except for there's some beads here and up here. And I am backstitching as I go because there's a ton of backstitching. So there she is.
and I'm not sure I, I have there's a prompt in School of Magical Stitches um, that I can use a fairy for and I'm not sure if I'm gonna work on her or if I'm gonna work on winter fairy I haven't decided that yet but um, one of those two will come out next not a ton of stitches in this because I think we only had to put 200 stitches in, but this is Village of Hawk Run Hollow uh, by Carriage House Sampling or Kathy Barrick. Uh, Barrick? I'm not sure where that came from. Kathy Barrick. Uh, I have finished the first five and I'm working on block six and I have started block eight, but six is kind of what I've been focusing on. Um, just FYI, there is a typo in the DMC conversion for block six. I had been looking for 860, I believe it is, to finish the grass down here. It's kind of a slightly darker yellow green. That color doesn't exist in DMC. It's 820. And if you look on the other blocks, you'll see that and on the main um, DMC conversion list you'll see that's what's listed so I unfairly said that my cat had stolen it because she does do that but not in this case so here's where I am on block six I worked on filling in more of the blacksmith sign and then I filled in down here in the ground to get to the point that I needed to get to um, I don't have that much left on this block. I will probably pull it out for something else if I can just to get it done. I've got um, obviously this section left of the, the barn. Um, there's a chimney that goes up here with some smoke and I think I have two more horses left up here and they're riders. So it's all the fiddly bits which you know take time. But here is where that whole thing is right now. And again, if you're new here, I am customizing this using um, names and place names and dates and things from my grandmother's family in central Pennsylvania. So there is that one done. Okay, let's see. Next, I told you there was a lot. Um, Summer Sampler. This is from the Cooler Design Studio, and I don't think I showed you my progress on this last time. I think I was working on it. Um, this is available either as a download from their online store at Cooler Design Studios. Uh, I believe 123 Stitch also has copies. There's four of these, and every time I work on this, I wonder why I'm not working more on it, and then I want to do all four of them. The fabric I'm using is a 32 count even weave from XG Designs. The colorway is sand, and here is where I am. You would have seen this on my whip parade, I think, but if you didn't watch my whip parade, here it is. So I finished this other shell. I worked more on... Um, this the little boy who's right here who's sort of starting to take shape I finished the shell down here <clears throat> I love how this is coming out I just you know time it's a time thing okay there's that one um, I actually pulled out my chatelaine this is a horrible photo, but it's all I've got because it's what's on the pattern. It's Desert Mandala, or Mandala, which I love since we are here in the Southwest. I am working this on a 28 count Lugana from Picture This Plus. The colorway is Calypso. And I did get a fair amount done on this, this go round. Let's see if I can get this in here. Okay, so I finished this entire upper border and then I started in on this side block. I worked that, I'm sorry, and that little piece there. So 
it will look exactly like this with the beads and the corner piece. Um, I have just about finished. I'm gonna, the way that I have been working this border is that I will put a color in and I'll you know work the little part of the motif that it is and then I'll park the thread and then I'll do the stuff in between and we'll kind of park all of those threads and then the next time let's say this orange color appears over here I will move the thread here and stitch it. So I kind of leapfrog my way down it rather than stopping and starting and these are so random feeling. They're not truly random, they do repeat, but they feel really random when you're stitching them that I just wound up doing it that way and that seems to work out and I have less counting errors. So when I'm ready to turn the corner and go down underneath Cocopelli here, I'll restart the threads and then I'll turn the corner. So I do have the center panel completely finished and that's where I am on that huge piece. Um, interestingly enough, I have gone back and forth about what this is, whether it's supposed to be snakeskin or whether it's supposed to be like a braided latigo, um, like leather. Um, so we had a, I'm going to call him very large, a very large snake that had, I, I think he got a little confused. He was on our back stone patio downstairs, which kind of deads end, dead ends into a wall. Um, but anyway, he was climbing up my screen and dude was like this big around and that's his markings, which are supposed to mimic a rattlesnakes. Bull snakes actually, they rattle their tails like rattlesnakes do. They're not, they're non-venomous. Non they're actually constrictors. Um, they normally are in like tall dry grass because that's what we have here in New Mexico. And so when they shake their tail, it makes the grasses rattle and it sounds like a rattlesnake, but they do not actually have rattles. So he wasn't in the grass and therefore you could actually see that he had no rattles. Um, I still did not want him in my house. Uh, we encouraged him to go someplace else. I, I'm fine with them having their life, doing their thing, just not in my house. Okay. Um, I pulled out... Welcome Summer by the Drawn Thread to work on. I just had a hankering to do something summery and this fit the bill and it worked for a couple of extra credit type things and various challenges. Um, I'm stitching this on a 28 count linen. Um, it's just a natural colored linen. Oops, where's my thread? And I'm actually doing two pieces on it. So I have the other one down at the bottom, but here is where I am on this. So I am working this using color and cotton hand dyed floss. And I love this dark denim that I chose for the letters. It's a really dark variegated blue. Let me put something behind that. I think it'll show up better. Yeah. So I have everything except the final E done. And then I started working on the flag there in the center. Uh, so I actually made really pretty good progress on this. I'm, I'm super pleased with how it's looking and it may come back out again before the summer season is over. I had a thought that maybe it would be fun to work on um, these for each season because I'm pretty sure over three months I could get one done. And I know we're already into summer here, a month almost. Um, but that's okay. I, I think... I'll, I can make some more progress on it throughout the month. I'll just pick, pick it up when I want to. Um, I have already finished the autumn one in that welcome series. Um, so I have that done and it'll be out this fall. Okay, next I worked on a long winter's nap. This is the ornament version. Artwork by Donna Gelsinger, and then it's charted by Heaven and Earth Designs. And I am here. This one will be back out for a Magical Stitches Extra Credit project. Uh, not sure if it'll be this month or into August, but at any rate. Um, I finished filling in here. 
his sweater and then I filled in a bunch of stuff through here with his beard and I'm kind of working my way up to that corner as I go. Love how it looks. I love all the detail in all the curling hair. I think that looks really fun. So I'm enjoying this. It's a completely different um, patterning of st stitches. There's a lot more blocks of color or sections where like one square only has maybe 10 or 12 colors as opposed to like 70. Which we're gonna talk about here right, right in a second. Since I am also working on a stitching shelf. Artwork by Amy Stewart, Charted by Heaven and Earth Designs. Um, I am working this on the 25 count Easy Grid, and I'm working this on the 25 count Easy Grid, both one over one, that's my go-to preferred method. I'm using this for the Tour de France challenge in the Full Coverage Fanatics group, and this is the project that I'm working on uh, for the entire tour challenge, which will be most of July. And then I'm also using it for the new challenge that Hayde put out, um, 10,000 stitches in a project between basically the beginning of July and December 24th. So I am here on this one. Um, let's see if we drop some of these. There's a lot, a lot, a lot of confetti in this page. It's just, So this is what I've done so far in July. And I think I'm up through stage 10 of the tour. I'm stitching ahead a little bit, but nicely enough, it worked for one of the homework prompts last week in Magical Stitches for 500 stitches. And this week, I think it, I think I have like 800 stitches I'm gonna put in on this because it works for a lot of the prompts. One of the prompts I don't have a project for, so I have to do 400 stitches. So they'll go, it'll go in this. And you know, I love how these roses look. I just, that cascade of them is so beautiful, but dang, there's a lot of confetti in that. You can see by the number of park threads I've got, there's, yeah, yeah. So that is as far as I've gotten on that one, but working away on it. Um, I'm still on my target for 2,600 stitches a month which is what I'm trying to do to get I think that put me at when I started it'll be six finished pages of the full size version in 2019 can't remember what year we were in all right um, almost there guys getting there I am currently working as of today on Joan Elliott's Celtic wheel You've seen this one before. I'm kind of using it as a focus, not focus on a finish, just as a focus piece. And really happy to report, I am almost done the first page of four on this. This is the bottom, this is the side. Um, I've gone over a little bit into page two, uh, just to sort of see how things balanced out. But I'm using this right now for an extra credit prompt to put in stitches in yellow. So I'm working on more of the gold braid. Um, and I'll easily have 500 stitches of gold in that. So what I have left to do on this page is to fill in these little tiny bits that get blue right there. Finish the braid down to here and finish the braid across. I have a couple of stitches, just nin ninja type stitches, to finish this little bit of the blue and white border right here. And then these two kind of butterfly wing shapes. And then that page will be finished, which is awesome. Um, this is a 32 count even weave in the colorway sampler gold from Color and Cotton. And I am stitching it using the called for threads, which are DMC love this I love working on this it makes me happy okay uh, last I wanted to show you guys my finish this is snow for Christmas which I have finished it is oh I missed a stitch right there in that snowflake okay well I, I am one stitch shy of finishing I will put that in today um, 
pattern is by Brenda Gervais. I stitched this on a 32 count Wren from Picture This Plus using coloring cotton and I think one gassed thread for the dark green and Victorian Motto sampler for the red and the blue. And I added a little jingle bell, which was called for in the pattern. Um, and I got that from Angela, Angela's Christmas box from Color and Cotton, uh, our holiday box of 2018. And I scooched everything in just a little bit to make this slightly smaller because um, there originally was a lot more space between this end of the sheep and the start of the sled and this ho, ho, ho. So everything from here was over a little bit and I was worried about running out of fabric. So I think it came out fine. I think if I hadn't told you all, you probably wouldn't know. But anyway, um, I'm just going to make this into a little cushion for my display for the holidays. Love it. It's super cute. This finished my um, Stitch 9 challenge for 2019. So that was my last project. Done. Awesome. Um, last, I have just a few things that I wanted to share with you guys as recent acquisitions. Uh, I guess I decided since I'm doing Stitch from Stash July through the end of the year that um, it would be okay to just go ahead and buy stuff here at the front and then try to chip away at it. I don't know if that's really my thinking, but that is how it's now going to work out. Um, whatever. It's fine. Uh, I picked this up. This came up on my Instagram feed from Pain Free Crafts, and I love this. I love, I just love everything about it. The dragonflies, the fox, the strawberries, which are very William Morris to me, the Celtic feel to it. It's supposedly based on Outlander because it's named Frasier, but that's not why I necessarily got it. I'm not against Jamie Frazier or anything to do with that. I just like the piece for the piece. It's full coverage. No idea when I will get to it, but I just really liked it. So, um, And I should say, I may remove the background on it myself and go with a hand paint. I think that would look really pretty, but that's a decision for another day. Um, I think if you guys watched my whip and planning video, you remember I'm planning to start the Jingle Bell Christmas tree farm next year. I have the fabric for it. I went ahead and I ordered the accessory pack uh, from the Silver Needle. So it's got the silks and it's got the beads in it. And I know Jessie Marie has done, I can't remember the name of it, but it's a pumpkin farm one. Um, and so... I know to be stingy with the supplies because she ran out working on hers and had to sub some stuff in. So um, we'll just see how it goes. I, you know, this was a lot easier though than sourcing each of these things individually, and I was feeling exceptionally lazy, but wanted to finish kitting this project up. Um, I now also because it. The accessory pack came with the pattern. I will, not today, but when I start this, probably be doing a giveaway um, of this pattern because now I have two. So stay tuned for that. And then lastly, I went ahead and I ordered, I needed a few things for two of the projects that I wanted to start next year. Um, one of them is Halloween Fairy by Nora Corbett. And I can't remember what the other one was. I have it written down in my book, but I don't have my book in front of me. So I got the Krynek I needed and the beads I needed. Nothing crazy. And it's a, it's a mishmash of stuff in here right now because it's for two different projects. So there is that. And then I went ahead and got the Overdyed Floss colors that I needed to start anniversaries of the heart flock one because I wanted to do a floss toss and see if I liked them on the uh, wren that I had I have a piece of in my stash that I'm thinking of using and so here are the gentle arts 
colors for that and the Weeks Dye Works colors that go with it. And that won't really show you very much, but that that is also Wren right there. And it's part of the same dye lot. So I think it will be okay. The um, This color right here is probably the one that will work the least well, but I still think it's light enough. Sorry, y'all are looking at my ugly back. I still think it's light enough because it's very similar to the lamb's wool that I used for the sheep. So I think it will still, I think it will still work okay. Um, so that's the plan for those. And um, yeah, I think that's finally it. In under an hour, that's pretty good. Uh, so what's going on this week? I am reading Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix. I've started that on audiobook. I am reading a book based on childhood memories. I'm reading a nonfiction book about Laura Ingalls Wilder and her writing, which is very interesting. More on those when I get them done. Uh, I'm gonna be working on a stitching shelf and more on Celtic wheel, as well as knitting on the beekeeper cardigan. So that will keep me occupied for the next couple of weeks. Um, not sure when I will record again. I am gonna probably try to record a little earlier rather than a little later. The next time I would record is a crazy, crazy weekend. Um, it's my birthday weekend, it's a treatment weekend, my husband's home and I have to pack to go to teach at Stitches Midwest like two days after that. So I'm gonna try to do it before all the craziness happens, but we will see how we go. If not, no one panic if I'm late and it takes me more like three weeks to get back. I will for sure tune back in then to catch up with y'all. So until next time I talk to you, I hope everybody has a great um, couple of weeks with all of their crafting and reading and other light things and that the weather is great wherever you are, that you're enjoying your season. Um, and I will check in with y'all later. So until then, everybody, take care.